Hello, everybody. Welcome to Thursday Night Live with Bill Tucci. Behold his mighty hand. Tucci gang, Tucci gang, Tucci gang, Tucci gang, Tucci gang, Tucci gang, Tucci gang. I just want to manage expectations. Weird. Weird. This is the worst. Fucking Bill sucks. Hey, everybody. There you go. How you guys doing? Teen Sensation Billy Tucci here. And I just want uh, to welcome everyone to the show. We got a great show tonight with uh, someone who's sort of a personal hero of mine. Um, he's, a, he's a legendary actor, screenwriter, director, and now comic book writer. Um, I guess we should just jump right into it. Um, he's got a Kickstarter that's live right now. And... Um, well, you know, without further ado, don't, ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only, Mr. Kevin Gravu. I don't know how to say your last name. Is it Graveau? Uh, it's actually Grievous. Oh, Grievous. Oh, I like Grievous. Yeah, 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 yeah. Rhymes with previous. Oh, I like Grievous. So, so it's a French name, so the That's pronunciations, well, you know. Forgive me, Grievous is awesome. <laughs> Yeah. And I think I knew that long time ago. We met. We met a long time ago, years ago. Um, and thank, welcome on to the Pop XP and uh, Thursday uh, Night Live with Billy Tucci. This is my weekly show that I get together with friends and people I admire, and we just kind of have fun. Uh, and we'll push your new Kickstarter because you got a you got a great campaign going. Uh, you just launched it, uh, and it's on Kickstarter. And we're gonna go. Uh, We'll just go step by step through it and all. But before we get to that, sir, could you, uh, for the uninitiative, could you give a little background on you, where you're from, how you got, you know, how you got started into film and all, and now into comics and, uh, you yeah, know, yeah, your yeah, story, sure. man. Sure, sure, sure. Well, you know, born in Chicago, raised in Minnesota, Boston, and New Jersey. And hmm. my senior year, we moved to Oakland, California. And, you know, I was there for, what, 10 months when I moved to D.C. and uh, went to Howard University and graduated there, <clears throat> did grad school there. And then it was there I decided that I wanted to get into Hollywood. So, you know, it took me a while to figure out how to do that, you know, and do it with a plan in mind and moved out here and have been trying to work ever since. What, so, so you got, I say, yeah, obviously you guys moved around a lot. What did you major at school when you went to Howard? Uh, I majored in microbiology, oh, you, know, and, oh, you know, oh. minored in, yeah, minored in chemistry and psychology. And, you know, it was a daunting task to say the least, but I thought I was headed on a di different, you know, career path uh, until Spike Lee came out with She's Gotta Have It. Mm -hmm. And I was in 86 and I was floored. And it wasn't because of the subject matter necessarily, but the fact that I didn't even know brothers could direct films and the fact that he directed this film using credit cards, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think he demystified film for a legion, you know, of, of Americans, you know, all over, you know, and it's like, I didn't know it was this accessible. And so, you know, the, the impetus for my getting into science in the first place as a career was really a sublimation uh, of my love for science fiction, you see, and trying to, you know, find some way to do that. So film was, I guess, the perfect crucible in which to, you know, tell science fiction stories and things of the like. And I was like, you know, this is for me. And it took a while to implement it, but, you know, I'm glad I did it. Yeah, so you grew up. So were you, like I said, into science fiction? Were you a monster kid or a you know sci-fi kid? kid. Did you... yeah, I was a monster kid at first, you know. Mm. Um, but then again, you know, it dovetails into reality because what are real monsters? Dinosaurs. Mm. You know what yeah. I'm saying? 
Yeah. And so, and I think every kid is, is somewhat, you know, every little boy at least, is somewhat fascinated with dinosaurs and the mm-hmm. fact that these huge things could be real. And when you're looking at pictures of dinosaurs and they're real, but you're looking at Godzilla and he's fiction, <laughs> you know, you're like, man, I wish, you know, I could see this, you know, in real life. So, you know, that was my, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, a lifelong passion of mine. Uh, and then I didn't get into comic books as a hobby until late. Uh, I think I got into them in 75. I was 12 years old. Mm. And, you know, uh, of course, I had had a few comics throughout the years, you know, but just a few, you know, I think monsters and especially those uh, Aurora monster models. Oh, man. Right. Those With those pictures. James Bama cover, pa- you know, the painting. Yeah yeah, yeah. And- yeah. And I looked at those and I'm like, man, this is cool. But once I got into comics, you know, it was funny because I remember I had been collecting them for a few weeks or a few months. And I was in this old comic book shop. And, you know, back then the comic book shops were really like um, used bookstores. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? There were no new comics, you know, no diamond, nothing. And so um, I remember flipping through the books and they were all, even the back issues, uh, you know, I guess until you got to 71, they were all 35 cents a piece. And that was, they were accessible because that's allowance money, money you find in, you know, your father's chair, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking through them and I'm like, how could I have missed this hobby all this time? Yeah, and it was so cheap to get into, inexpensive, and there was just this uni- this whole universe that opened up. You know, I was surprised that I hadn't uh, gotten into it before. So that started this long life passion of really being a comic book, you know, uh, you know, fan. And I never thought I would wind up working at Marvel or DC, you know, let alone starting my own company, comic book company. And so uh, it's just been fun <laughs> you know ever since you know yeah so um i'm looking at you is that a minnesota vikings helmet behind you real quick uh yes it is sir yeah, so okay so <laughs> is that your team yes it is that's your, okay so that's your team all right okay <laughs> yeah 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 because so i'm trying seven. to track you know like if you're a skins fan or a commander's fan now because you, you yeah, see yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm a lifelong vikings fan i suffered through them through the uh the tough years you know the uh i didn't see the first super bowl but you know the three super bowls that they lost the hail mary you know it's it's hard to be a vikings fan but you know that's the way it is that's the way it is yeah yeah you've got you guys have had some horrible losses in the past couple of years like just like shocking beyond belief Bad luck, but it's you know, know. they got a great team. They got a you know the fan base is fantastic. There, I'm a Dolphins fan, and I'm right. a uh, and Giants are my NFC team. But uh, I grew up a Dolphins fan. But um, going back to because um, I want to build up towards the the campaign yeah. is is uh, like you said you like monsters, right? Yes. Um, we have a, a Stippling Vaughn. How you doing, Stippling Vaughn? We got a, a lot of our friends in. Thank you guys for watching. Oh, imagine if Kevin did the voice for the lava monster for Kit Carter. Um, <laughs> everyone, you're, you're, well, your voice is 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 legendary. Um, yeah, that's what they tell me. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> uh, Aaron Lepresti, another buddy of ours. You know, Aaron. Uh, Aaron's oh, got yeah. Kit Carter. He just wants Kit Carter on on Indiegogo. Uh, so yeah, I could definitely see that. Hey, Kevin Ryan, good to see you. Marcus Killigrew, the great Dan Genovese. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, Paulus Arts, thank you for joining us. Um, appreciate all you guys here. Patrick T, uh, just just always a great group. We're like a family. We have a lot of fun. And okay. uh, thank you guys for joining us. But you got into Monsters. And I want to talk about those Aurora kits, if you can. Um, right. Just just real quick. It's like, remember that Aurora did the dinosaur line? Remember yeah, they like the snapped together thing. ones? But they were phenomenal. They had that great Allosaurus yeah. and the and the you know the the the, uh, the cave and the saber tooth tiger. I still call a saber tooth cat a saber tooth tiger. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, I, you know I remember those, and you know I would buy one. I would try to buy one once a week. You know, uh, I had the Allosaurus, the uh, uh, Tyrandon. You know, uh, I I kind of checked out once they did that big T Rex. 
and I just knew I was kind of getting out of the the phase, but also yeah. that was it was a little bit too big for my shelf. Mm. And I'm like, how am I gonna display this? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. And it's it, it, you know they had that one. I think they had a Brontosaurus uh, two that was larger. But you know I think uh, I think they try to have a combination, you know, of the Cenozoic era and um, and and you know the Cretaceous period, you know. Um, you know, with their array of kits, you know, yeah. and I thought they were, I thought they were great. I had the Neanderthal, mm -hmm. you know, didn't, didn't like the, cro you know, uh, Cro-Magna woman, the K woman. Yeah, they had that right, that her, and then they had the Neanderthal with the rock, maybe had the exactly. rock. Exactly, yeah, yeah, I had that one, you know, and, um, you know, I learned to paint a little bit, but I had a kid's sensibility then. So I remember painting them in a, in ways that maybe weren't as good, and I knew that, and I stopped painting them. But you know, I would only paint certain parts. You know, yeah. like for the saber tooth cat. You know, uh, only the you know the eyes, the teeth, and the red tongue, things like that. Mm -hmm. It was also interesting too, and it just shows you how a kid progresses. Uh, I did not discover flat paints until later on. You know, they were all shiny. Like, I remember I had the, the uh, what did they call it? Did they call it? They didn't call it the prehistoric bird, but they called well, it. Uh, it was, a, it was a, the pterodactyl. No, 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 no. no. Oh, that big no. bird? Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, I don't remember the name I of that bird. They called it, but see, I didn't, uh, I had just discovered um, those flat paints. And I'm like, okay, so this is how they get them to make them, you know, not shiny and all that other stuff. Right. So you know, that was kind of fun, you know. Yeah, you they know, were those testers, like, those tester yeah, paints. Yeah, I remember I added some things to the King Kong model. Like I, I used tin foil to put, you know, those cuffs on them. Yeah. I got some cheap chains, you yeah. know, put them on his wrist. And I thought that was uh, that was a cool innovation. And I think I got that from a famous Monsters uh, film land cover. Mm. You know, that idea. So I was like, yeah, this is cool. I like this. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so well, then you got into comics. What was your favorite comic? Uh, to tell you the truth, it was the Fantastic Four was my top, top one. Mm. And then it was the Hulk. And I think the reason that happened is because my grandfather had bought uh, my brothers and I some treasury editions. And I had gotten the Fantastic Four and the Hulk Treasury Editions. And those things were phenomenal in terms of introducing kids uh, to comics and the variety of different stories that could be told with the characters. And for $1.50, you could immerse yourself in that world. And I guess it just stuck with the Fantastic Four and the Hulk. And I mm. still think to this day, now, this is my opinion, of course. Uh, I think the issues of Fantastic Four, like 36 until maybe 76 were unparalleled. You know, I mean, you know, Stan and Jack created so many rich characters from that single run, you know, of 40 something issues. I was like, this is phenomenal. You know, Galactus, Black Panther, Silver Surfer, you know, him. You know, uh, the Inhumans. There were just so many. You know, it was it, it, it was great. It was yeah. great. You know, that time was so phenomenal. Those those late sixties uh, to the seventies. You know, just yeah. uh, just phenomenal. Especially the Marvel stuff. And I was, you know, more of a Marvel kid. You know, than a DC guy. Um, yeah, so yeah, I love yeah. I love the War books though. That those were my ultimate favorites. But. You know, you just you couldn't beat that combination. You just couldn't beat them. No, no, and, and especially for if you look at the entertainment value for the price. I mean, you know, you really couldn't beat it. You mm. really couldn't. And you know, I, I think kids nowadays are just missing out on the richness of that period because I don't think the books are as good anymore. No, you know, that's no. why I look at the independent books, the independent landscape. Mm. And I'm like, well, this is where it is. You know, I look at Walt Simonson's uh, Ragnarok. Yeah. I'm like, and now this is my opinion again. I think he is better as an artist and storyteller now than when he was at Marvel doing Thor. You know, 
And then you hear, you know, some of these editors say that, oh, well, Walt, Walt style is out of date. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I know. I know. And I'm like, hey, boy, you guys don't know what you're talking about. And it's stuff like that, you know. I don't, I don't get it. I really don't get it. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, and the thing is, is now that the artists they're looking at like Discord artists, you know, or just garbage, like like manga light type of artists, yeah. and you have you know true, you know, gods like that, you know, like him, like Walter, and you know Chris Claremont yeah. telling me he can't, you know, Marvel won't hire. I, he has a contract with Marvel. He's under contract with Marvel, but yeah. he's not getting any work from them. It, I know. I know. <laughs> it's, and and you it see makes zero but, sense. Yep, but I and, kind of feel, I, and I wonder, is that because the big two have, be, have become so corporatized that they feel that you don't need people who like comics in order to make comic book decisions? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so you can feel the lack of passion in the stories and in the art. They're just churning out whatever comes to mind. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, and I don't think that's the way it works. Really yeah, don't. it doesn't seem it doesn't seem planned. Um, it, again, flavor of the month. A lot of this. I mean, if you read a comic today, you look at it. You have of the twenty pages, twenty two pages. You've got fifteen of them just sitting around talking. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so exactly. how do you get someone in there? You know, if you remember the Fantastic Four, you know the 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 great episode, this man, this monster. Oh yeah. Four, right. I think to me, it's one of the greatest comic comics of all time that's 24 pages today that would have been a 12 issue miniseries exactly and, and it, it's and and how do you get new readers like that and that's why we're rising i feel you know i've always been an independent guy i'm very fortunate with the work i did mostly for dc comics i'm appreciative of them um but there's nothing nothing compares to to doing your own books creating you know exactly. to, to to creating your own properties and seeing them see come to life and see fruition because there's no greater joy than someone coming up to you with something you created that you own and asking you to exactly. sign it and then saying thank you, you know? Exactly. It's like, yeah, exactly. man, thank you. <laughs> yeah, 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 you, you know, exactly. And, and you know, they, I think the fans see the passion in the independent creators, you know, and they feed off of that. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, there was like this one thing I I understand in a peripheral sense, but I don't think it has to be that way. And that is that a lot of the independent companies like Dark Horse, IDW, you know, um, for, for a long time, they wanted to stay away from doing superheroes because they thought that Marvel and DC had had a lock on them. Right. And it's like. You know that if Marvel had that attitude about DC, how much richness would we be missing? And so what I'm saying is that there are room for more types of stories and definitely more superhero type stories. And you know, after 10 or 20 years of doing them, well, you're right in the mix with everyone else, or you can be. Yeah. You know, the only yeah. thing that you might be lacking is the machine to have, you know, to turn out you know, story after story after story on a monthly basis. Right. But I think that if you create a character like you created she, you know, um, after a while, people just, it just grows on people. And it's like, okay, this is what I'm talking about. Yeah. This is using independent power uh, to create some new heroes that people can just look at and enjoy, you know. Agreed. I mean, and you know, our friend Brian Polito, I was talking to Brian at the show we were at and when we were at Tucson yes. um, at the hotel in the bar after one night after the show. And, uh, you know, we were talking about, uh, you know, these corporate comics, you know, they get all the mainstream press, right? They get Newsarama, they get CBR, yes. they get all these, all these, you know, uh, screen rant, all these things and article after article after article us, there's no coverage of us. You could send yeah. them, you know, you could say, you know, Kevin Grievous is doing, you know, a, a new Kickstarter, blah, blah, blah. And you think that that would be the headline on every news and every comic book news page, at least for a day or part of a day. No, they don't yeah. even they don't even cover us. And the thing is, though, I'm talking to Brian, the same thing with Brian, that Brian has made millions in the past 
decade they've been doing the Lady Death, you know, Lady Death books, you know, through Kickstarter and all, less than a decade, I think, um, seven years or so. And um, he's made seven, eight million dollars or something like that, or more. I can't even imagine how much, how much they, that company has brought in. And they can't get any coverage anyway. He's just given up. And and the thing that I think, though, that, that it seems is that same thing with us. I send out press releases every week. We have a few of them that do actually cover us, and thank you guys for that. But the mainstream ones, the big ones, don't at all. And you know, we've learned what I've learned, Kevin, is two things: is one, th there's never been a better time to publish and create your own independent comics than today. I agree. I agree. And also, we do not need that mainstream press; they have no power. Yes. Because the fan, because I'm having the best two, three. I'm having the best three years we've had in 25 years. Right. And we owe all that to the fans because like shows like this or little shows like this, that we can go directly to the fans and we can reach out to them through YouTube and through Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, things like that. And the comic book press, you know, and how snooty they could be, et cetera. But they're completely ineffective. They're completely, they showed how impudent they are. I feel. Exactly. Agreed. Agreed. Yep. So get it back. So you, you're a comics fan because I, I love what you brought about Spike Lee um, and how he inspired you. And as you said, you never knew brothers made films. And not yeah. only inspired, he inspired generations of yeah. independent films, especially African-American kids, you know, that, wow, exactly. I can do this and with credit cards and make a film and become a superstar. Um, yeah. I still hold him personally responsible for uh, for blowing the, uh, the Knicks against the Pacers that time. <laughs> Um, again, <laughs> getting Reggie Miller all getting Reggie Miller all amped up, you know what I mean? And putting him in the zone, thanks a lot for that one, Spike. Um, but uh, you can't deny the man's talent and what he's been able to accomplish, yes. Um, so okay, so now you go, you want to get head out to head out to out west, you want to go to Hollywood, you want to move from this, from this, from this science uh field that you think you'd go into this career path. So now you yeah. want to get into the create into the creative career path. You want to get into film. You want to get into creating. How did, how did that transition work? Well, it didn't work very well. You know, <laughs> uh, you know, it's like I basically had to quit cold turkey. You know, I in fact I remember being in seminar when I was in grad school, and at the time I was working, man, I kid you not, it must have been three jobs. Mm. and going to grad school at the same time. So I would work as a security guard in the, you know, we uh, from, well, I would go to school from like 10 to 2, then drive to my security job, you know, from like 3 to 11, and then go bounce at a nightclub, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, from, yeah, yeah. You, know, you know, from midnight, you know, to three o'clock in the morning, two or three o'clock in the morning, and then get up in the morning and start the whole day all over again. Yeah. And in between that, I had to study and figure out how to uh, get into the film business. Because while I was taking um, genetic engineering courses in grad school, I was congruently taking television and film courses just to acclimate myself to this uh, new field I wanted to get into. And so it wasn't easy, but <clears throat> I will say by the time I got to, uh, I guess the middle of the semester, I was in seminar and I was actually writing a screenplay and, you know, I remember the professor said something, which I knew to be true and I wanted to do it, but he said, you know, getting a master's is fine, but it's only going to give you responsibility over someone with a BA or a BS. It's not going to get you any more money or any more power. You have to go for your PhD. And my thing was like, well, yeah, that's what I planned on doing. The problem is I was 25 at the time. And when you look at my having two years to do in the master's program and, you know, three to seven years to work on your PhD, depending upon your dissertation, uh, what, what particular field you're going to focus on, I was like, you're looking at my, you know, my being like maybe 32 or 33 before I get my PhD. Right, right. And I was like, I don't know, <laughs> you know, and the money, especially working for the government, which I was at the time, I was working at uh, 
NIH laboratories in Bethesda, Maryland, which is right over the border of DC and working at the National Cancer Institute. And it was in the laboratory of biochemistry. And I knew a lot of, you know, the, you know, up and coming PhD scientists, like there was Dean Hamer, you know, uh, down the hallway, I worked for him. There was Robert Gallo who isolated the, uh, the HIV virus, the AIDS virus. You know, he was upstairs. I was, he was in a P3 lab. I was at a P2 lab. I mean, it was, you know, it was fascinating, you know, but my goodness, I, I think I was making. That's so, okay. So you... Three, two, two. And, you know, on my, my first commercial, I was uh, in front of the camera. I was on set for two hours in front of the camera for 20 minutes and made $60,000. And I'm like, you're like, Ooh, I might be in the wrong business. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and not that it was about money, right? but it was about survival. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it was rough. So, you know, that right away made me say, you know what? I think I'm done with science. Love it. But no. So then, okay, so now you make the jump. You want to become an actor. You want to become a writer. Um, you're this brilliant man. Um, you head out there. Uh, you know, you, you, know you, you get some parts and some films. Uh, and then you and uh, and early, I got a, a I made a mistake early. I didn't make a mistake. I misspoke when I said and now comics writer. You've been a yeah, comic, yeah, you've yeah, been a comic yeah, writer yeah. for almost twenty years or so. Um, I meant like now as a as a independent you know self publisher Kickstarter. Um, but I was going so fast because we came in late. Um, and then Underworld happens. And yes. where did you come up with the concept for that? How did you get this idea that you had, and I forget, with Weissman, I think it was, or somewhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. Lynn Weissman was our director. Yes, Len, yeah. How did, can you tell us the story of that? Because I love that franchise. Um, yes, yes, I yes. love the premise behind it. I love all the layers to it, what you did. Um, and uh, just curious, you know, how, how did that come about? Yes, yes. So I didn't want to be an actor at all. I came out to Hollywood specifically to be a writer. But I also realized quite astutely that if you're going to make it in Hollywood or make it in Hollywood, um, you have to choose your battles carefully. And one of the things I discovered is that the best way to give yourself the best chance is to kind of diversify your creative lexicon. So you might come out there to do one thing, but you better learn how to pivot real quick. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah. And, you know, that's what I did. So my thing is, came out there to be a writer, knew nobody. But someone saw me, thought I had a look and a voice and a size and a build or whatever. And said, you know what? You could probably act too and, you know, make money. And that was true. And so that enabled me to, you know, start doing day player parts, this, that, and the other, um, while I was waiting for my writing to germinate and really, you know, come to fruition. Now, um, to do that, I didn't know anyone didn't have an agent, but I started doing extra work. And extra work, I tell people, is probably the best free film school that you will ever attend, especially if you do two things. One, you keep your mouth shut. You know, two, you you become very, very observant. And if you do those two things, you can kind of pick your way around a set, see, see how the different parts work, see yeah. who's in charge, and see how something is actually done. Now, that's how I met Lynn Wiseman. Uh, I was an extra on a movie called Stargate, and he was a prop assistant. So he thought I might have been like a bigger actor or something like that. I'm like, no, you know, but, you know, he liked the same kind of films I did. You know, even the stupid schlock monster stuff, mm. you know what I'm saying? But to me, that's the that's where the gold is. And mm. that's where the real passion is. And so uh, we maintained a friendship. You know, he would stay in my house, you know, when he would come down because he was living up in, I think, Mateo, San Mateo or on, you know, somewhere in the Bay Area, you know, on the San Francisco side. So um, 
So one day he started doing, you know, music videos, but the agency he was with wasn't giving him any good scripts. So he, they sent him on a call to, I think the name of the company was Dimension. And they wanted to do a werewolf movie because Blade was doing so well for the vampire genre. So uh, he calls me and he says, well, you know, what do you think? You know, can we do something like this? And I'm like, you know, it depends. And the reason I say that is because there have really only been two werewolf movies to speak of, you know, that really did anything. And, you know, that's with modern audiences. And, and that was uh, The Howling mm-hmm. and, where, you know, um, uh, American Werewolf in London. Right. Now, I didn't really like American Werewolf in London, but one thing I did like was the werewolf creature, you know, because it was bipedal, snout nose. I think it was walking on all fours there, but yeah, yeah, it was intimated, yeah, that it could also stand. And the howling, these werewolves stood on two feet, and I was like, oh, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Mm. So I said, if we can do the same kind of werewolf creature, that they were doing in the howling, I'm down like a clown. You know what I'm saying? And so, so I said, give me a week and I'll come up with something. So a week passed and I pitched it to him and he liked it. So we started banging the story around and we decided to meet at his house to go over the details. But when we were there, um, I said, we can't go in there with just one idea. We had completed our our session for the day. I said, we have to have two ideas in case they don't like this one. And he was like, well, you know, I don't have anything. And he said, well, what if we do this? What if we did a Romeo and Juliet story? But instead of uh, vampires, instead of, you know, werewolves, you know, Amante using Capulets, what if we had werewolves on one side but vampires on the other and made it a kind of you know surrealistic interracial love story that spanned a centuries old race war and i tell you this cat just folded his arms looked at his feet and was like i don't know dude is this gonna work well, here we are five movies later. Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, you know, my, my, my direct inspiration, uh, I guess, was kind of threefold. The first inspiration as to why I wanted to come up with a second idea uh, is because I had a friend who was working in the, uh, who was a writer and was and had a pitch meeting at uh, the Jim Henson Company. And you know how you go into one of these pitch meetings and you, you know, you have your concomitant, you know, small talk and all that. And, you know, he did that and they launched it and the guy said, well, you know, what do you got? And it says, we had this cool Bigfoot story. And what we were thinking, the guy was like, I, we already have a Bigfoot story. Oh. What, what else do you have? And he looked at his partner and was like, uh, well, that's it. And he's like, okay, well, you know, you guys come back, <laughs> you know, you have something. Yeah. And suffice yeah. it to say, he never got back in that room. And I did not want that to happen to us. So my thing was to come up with a second story. Now, the other inspirations were the fact that I had done some interracial dating. And the way people looked at us, you know, was crazy, you know. And it's like, you know, what year is it? It was that and the fact that I couldn't understand after having like the Universal Monster movies, right? Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. have Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. You have the House of Dracula, both the House of Dracula and the House of Frankenstein, where all three monsters fight and you never do it again. Yeah. Yeah. You, you yeah. know, I'm like, you know, I'm like, I can't be the only guy who has thought this before. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So yep. my thing is like, you know, let me, let's go in this direction. Have these monsters fight, make them races, and have them in this race war. You know, and it's kind of like, you know, the cat calling, you know, the uh, the um, pot calling the kettle black. 
Right. You know, they're both monsters, but they both hate each other for being different. <laughs> and they're afraid of the hybrid, you know, the, the interracial byproduct of their union. Right. You know, uh, but, you know, no one got it. But finally, we, you know, in fact, the script went around all around town. And, you know, we got another writer and we uh, went all around town and everyone was saying, this doesn't make any sense. You have a new writer, you know, new director. And whoever thought that werewolves and vampires were fighting, like, well, why are they fighting? They didn't understand. Yeah. But you yeah. see, they're not genre people like we are. Right. You know, and because of that, they're, you know, you know, these things make them incredulous. They're like, I, I can't see it, you know. And and even the company that finally bought it passed on it twice before. It's just that it came in through a back channel where it got a yes all the way up until it got to him again. And he said, I already passed on this tw uh, uh, twice. Ugh. And they're like, yeah, but why? Yeah. This is what we need. And so that's part of the reason why it's so hard to get something done in Hollywood that is not, you know, generic or, you know, the same. Because people don't understand these worlds and they're unwilling to step outside of that in order to see how cool these things can be. You know, look at this current superhero uh, craze. We've been told for years they won't, it won't work. Right. Marvel steps in and does phenomenal work now admittedly you can say the technology didn't exist to do it right until recently you know what i'm saying yes, okay. yes. I, I i get that but still to to dismiss it outright when you never liked this stuff in the first place you're not giving it a chance you're really not you know and so that's how the whole thing came to be yeah, it's a frustrating, it's a frustrating place, but you did it, man. You broke that wall. Yes. And and well deserved. And and uh, and you know, thank you as a fan <laughs> for it, you know, and, and that's now continued on. And you know, uh just uh, you know, again, you say you're not an actor, but you're a fantastic actor. <laughs> <laughs> um and now, uh, and now let's let's you know. I, I said we go forty five minutes, and we're already forty two, and so let's. Uh, for the reason okay. why you're here, and I apologize, sir, for that. My bad. Um, no, no, no. I got. I I I, I can talk to you for hours. I, that's why I'm bummed out that I had my wife with me. Uh, my, you know, at at the Tucson Comic Con, and we saw you briefly when you came by to say hello and all, and I yeah. seen you say hi, but um, like afterwards because we don't really know the town much, so we kind of stayed local at the hotel um i know i know i know i know but we didn't really see you which sucks you know i was looking forward to you know i, know. I, I, I don't know show a little bit and yeah i don't know if you remember but uh i think I, I reached out to you once but i guess i didn't articulate myself uh enough i was actually on a team to uh bring she to the film mm -hmm. uh world you know, I was working with a woman named Amy uh, Mimi Jitlin. Yeah, me. Yeah, Mimi. Yeah, she was. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But it, once again, they didn't understand. <laughs> you know, and yeah, I saw I, that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so. I mean, they, Mimi's when they told me that you know the, the with the story with Anna that it was a little too Asian, and they wanted to change her last name from Ishikawa to Anna Lane. She was our film producer, um, and I really got along well with her. But she, but I was supposed to be involved in everything. You know, and uh, you're the one who told me when we were in Virginia, like, oh, yeah, we're I'm like, oh, you are I'm like, oh, my yeah. God, I would love for you to work on this. Finally, someone that gets it, because, again, dealing with it, it was such a frustrating experience. Um, yeah, and we're kind of going through it again now, but it's not frustrating. We have uh, th thank God. Thanks to all you people out there watching that um, we're uh, you know, we've got interest again. So we'll see. Knock on wood. We'll see what happens. But. I was never crazy about that town. Um, yeah. Very frustrating, like like with you. Um, I mean, I've said things to people. You know, I've told them that their movies suck. That's why I don't want to sign up with sign with them. And stuff. And, you know, because I just have time for this. Because I don't need to do it. Yeah. I, you know, I've, I always felt that I'll make it, you know, 20 years from now myself. You know? Exactly. Um, 
but uh, you know, uh, enough of enough of me and, and my trials and tribulations, but let's talk. And is it, is it Jintara? Jintara. Yes. All right. All right. Yeah, Jintara. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. And it's a uh, kind of like a, uh, you know, an extrapolation of, well, not extrapolation, just the way I kind of twisted the word gin, mm -hmm. you know, and made it, you know, try to make it really interesting, you know, for, uh, you know, for this, uh, you know, for this tale. And, you know, simply put, it's about a, a police officer who is terminally ill, you know, mm -hmm. with cancer and is, is, is chasing after a serial killer that has terrorized the D.C., you know, uh, area. And DC Maryland area, as we call it, you know, the DMV. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, while she's on this endeavor, uh, you know, she uh, she realizes that she is part of an ancient race of genies, which we call Jen. Oh, and, cool. <laughs> yeah. And now has these powers. But, you know, how is she to use the powers? And she's caught between using them selfishly, you know, uh, which could lead to her uh, basically being seduced by its dark power or just rejecting it outright. And, but she realizes also she could use the power to help bring these, you know, the serial killer to justice. So it's that kind of interplay of, you know, impossible choices you know, amidst a, you know, something that she wants to do, you know, with a greater good that makes the story really interesting. And this is the story I want to bring to the audience. Yeah. And this artwork is phenomenal. Yes, yes. It's by Elmo Bondock. Golly. Uh, Filipino, Filipino uh, creator, uh, you know, artist. And he is simply, you know, phenomenal. He really is. Well, let's let's take a look at the trailer. And uh, and let's get let let's uh, let's get into it. Okay. Hello, Kevin Greedy is here. As a Hollywood writer who has worn many hats over the years, I'm best known for having created and written the original screenplay to the successful Underworld franchise, as well as High Frankenstein. I've written comics for both Marvel and DC Comics, having lent my talents to working on characters like Spider-Man, Blade, Doctor Strange, Iron Man, the New Warriors, and I created the much loved. Blue Marvel. Well, I've created my own comic book company, Darkstorm Comics and Media, through which I can create my own comic book characters for eager audiences to enjoy. Characters like Darkstorm, Shuraka, I Frankenstein, and King of Killers, just to name a few. And the new project that I want to tell you about today is Gentara, Rise of the Gen. Now, this is a story that I've had in my head for quite some time. And it brings together three of my favorite genres, fantasy, monsters, and gritty detective drama. Jintara Rise of the Jet is the story of Tamara Brazil, a terminally ill Washington, D.C. police detective who, while on the trail of a dangerous serial killer, discovers that she is part of an ancient race of genies called Jen. But what happens when she also discovers that she is the prophesied leader of one of these spiritual factions who wants her to not only aid them in a war against their own kind, but against mankind as well. Can she resist the temptation and maintain her humanity? That's the question. Or will she succumb to the evil power that now swells within her? Now, the contents of this book was released in 2022 as a three issue miniseries published by myself and my two great friends, Joe Brucia and Ralph Tedesco at Zenoscope Entertainment, and phenomenally illustrated by the talented Elmo Bondock. Well, we're now collecting those three issues in a trade paperback with additional material, which includes an all-new surprise cover by artist extraordinaire of the great Ron Garden, if we are able to meet our goal. So I ask you, will you please help us in getting this fantastic project into your hands as soon as possible. Thank you. Fantastic. We got to get Ron Garney to promote this darn book. Let me, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, let, let's get that uh, berserker crowd in there. 
Um, you know, so this is your first Kickstarter. You just launched it recently. You got 36 yeah. days to go. You're approaching $10,000. Yes. Um, and uh, what's it like putting together your first Kickstarter? Anything? Uh, uh, you know, man, it was daunting. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and in talking to other creators, uh, you know, you see what the future can look like, both good and bad. You know, the bad meeting, you know, once you start to fulfill and, you know, the, 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 um, I guess, uh, real difficulty in trying to fulfill, but then you look at the rewards of putting a book that you created in fans' hands, that makes it all worth it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and then working with good people like Ron, you know, Elmo, you know, Joe and, um, and uh, and Ralph, Ralph, you know, Ralph. all that is cool, you know. Uh, uh, Ralph and Joe and I have uh, have had problems because they're Philadelphia Eagle fans. Oh, so. <laughs> my brother Isaac is an Eagles fan. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, so, so we try to give each other the business, but you know they're great guys to work with. Yeah. you know. And so yeah, man, you know we're really trying to uh, put this bad boy together and make some real inroads into this crowdfunding thing and you know if 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 i were to be honest with myself i would say crowdfunding is what's going to save comics really you know and maybe more to the point preserve comics in terms of what they were mm -hmm. you know these crucibles of artistic and literary um you know art talent you know action adventure you know the independent you know uh product is really where it's at you know i mean the way i like to describe what comic books really are or wanted to be in a sense they were kind of like the the handheld version of the saturday matinee you know what i'm saying yes sir. Now, you know you know that might have been before our time but it might father's time i remember him telling us about his mother would give him and his brother a nickel and they go to the theater and they see you know all these serials like you know his favorite was flash gordon you know mm -hmm. merciless and those cats you know uh batman captain marvel right before the main feature you know what i'm saying you stay you know spend all day at the at the theater you know you know, watching these movies for just a little bit of money. And I think comic books, you know, are analogous to that, you know. Uh, and so this is what I, I kind of want to do now. And, well, they, you you know, they were born, yeah, they were born from that, from the pulp yes. and from the materials. Absolutely. Yes. You're right, you're right. And and we have lost that, you know. Um, it, it, there's so much, ah, man, we can go into this and talk about this. I was thinking about <laughs> having, you know, yeah, I know. Call it, we're going to call it um, All Stars, and I'd love for you to be on it because I really and Ron has said he'd be on it too. And oh, cool, and, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Love that, love that, get a couple that. of yeah, get a couple of a couple of guys and gals on there, and we'll just talk about this and and you know to save love this that. industry because the industry is in deep shit. And um, and I think I think you're 100 percent yeah, right. Sure. Yep. Um, about uh, that that the hope yeah. lies with us, and I do see with crowdfunding. Because the cool thing about crowdfunding too, Kevin, is that yes. is that our fans hold us accountable. If we don't deliver this book, or if we deliver a subpar pro, uh, you know, property or product, they're yes. not going to come back. That's true. That's you know, true. so and and it holds us. Like I said, it holds us accountable to put out the best work we can, and I to give, us, give give them our very best because they deserve it. Because it's not it's not cheap <laughs> it, you know like as you, said, you know to, to publish a comic it's not especially when you have lower print runs like we do for the most part most yes. of our books even the most successful you know like my our books are doing really well so our campaigns we just did another one and it's the it's our sixth our fifth um she campaign in a row that's done over two hundred thousand copies right two hundred thousand dollars but the the print run of those books are less than say what my Variant cover would have been in 1997 of the total right. of a variant cover. So it's it's great because we you, you're we're cultivating almost like I said like a family with 
with our backers who really are our partners yes. in a way. And That's we true. and they deserve our very best. And I love what you got going with this campaign because it's really clean, it's really simple. And I, you know, I know that I'm uh I might be uh guilty of this is to do a, a campaign that might be a little gets a little confusing with all the levels we do, but I love how you've got very minimal, very affordable levels. Um, you could just back it if you believe in the project, which is great. Any amount as low as a dollar. Uh, you can have your digital, you know, uh, the gin, you know, the, the Gintara um, digital edition. Uh, you've got, you know, the trade paperback, 30 bucks. You know, again, these aren't, you know, the, the, these aren't um, uh, big run books. What's the page count? The page count is going to be around 128. So for, so for 30 bucks, you get 128 you know, a 128 page book. Um, beautiful. You have the swag box. What do you got with the swag box here? Oh, uh, we got a couple of things. You know, we got um, the book itself, you know, uh, a trading card, poster, you know, bookmarks, things of that nature. Well, it's it, it's great. You got the great Garney variant. You got shirts. Who doesn't love apparel? You know? Exactly. And, and you get, you know, again, signed, you know, you sign, you're signing the things too. You, you know, people pay to buy your autograph and now you're getting yeah, a, a book exactly. with it as well. <laughs> exactly. It's, I got it, Kevin, it is, uh, Mr. Grievous, it's, it's a fantastic, uh, fantastic premise of fancy. It looks beautifully executed. This is the, this is the, the, the tier I, I, I want to talk about. Uh, this is so great. That actually somebody could call you and talk to you on the exactly yeah. exactly basically I give them the Hollywood pitch, you know mm -hmm. how to survive in Hollywood things of that nature, you know kind of an insider's view of what it's like, you know so they can ask me any question I'll answer it, you know. Mm -hmm. And you could also help someone who wants to crowdfund their own books exactly. too. But now that you've done exactly. this, and you know exactly. talk, you know teach, tell them the things, the steps you did, but also more importantly. And I'm sure you'll have it, or even when this campaign's over, you'll have a lot more. Um, what you shouldn't do, what you did wrong, right? Like things, exactly. mistakes. Because every campaign brings its mistakes. But you're on your way, sir, with this. Exactly. And um, it, again, it's a beautiful. I myself for a minute. Can you hold on? Sure. Hey, anything. Um, guys, I mean, I, I said, like I said, look, look at Mr. Grievous. Uh, I'm a huge fan of his, as you could tell. If I'm uh, stuttering a little bit here, I just, I really admire this man, all that he's accomplished. Um, uh, I'm a huge Underworld fan. And um, I, th I think for a first time, you know, uh, first time Kickstarter that he's doing crowdfunded campaign, this, th this book is gorgeous. And we will ask him, I know we have a lot of backers that are primarily Kick uh, Indiegogo backers or crowdfund my comic backers. So I'll ask uh, Kevin about them as well. And if you guys have any questions right now, please uh, post it in the chat. And, uh, you know, while we got him here for a few more minutes, why not? You know, let's uh, let's let's take it to the man. And uh, the link is in the description. Thank you, Mr. Kill Kellegrew, for uh, keep continually posting um, the link to it. And and he Kevin's one of the good guys. Uh, everyone out there, he's he's a no. He's a straight shooter. No bullshit artist. Uh, and a man who's, who's really accomplished a lot um, on his own and and knows the game in Hollywood and, and, and had to play it, which, again, for anyone who's been involved in it, it is so insanely frustrating. Um, it'll drive you drive you up the wall. Uh, it's just a hateful, evil place. <laughs> but it's business and you got to look at it as a business. So uh, that's that's that. But again, guys, if you can, please. Look at, uh, check out, uh, I got to say, Jintara. Um, and this man's a genius, for goodness sakes. Uh, he really is. I mean, he's a, he's a chemical, what is he, a biochemical engineer? He wanted to be a biochemist. Uh, and uh, and a, just an all-around terrific, um, terrific creator and a fan to the show. Um, let's see uh, what we got here. I got Paul Taylor. Thank you, Ta Mr. Taylor. As always, hang on. That's a tip. I think uh, your boy Zach ruined my belt. I think he destroyed my belt. Anyway, great chat tonight. Uh, Billy, are there pl any plans to do were werewolf vampire comics or do other companies have the rights? 
I'll bring that up to, to Mr. Grievous too, uh, Mr. Grievous too. But um, no, they're, they're public domain. Uh, even Dracula is in the public domain, actually. So you could use Dracula if you'd like. Um, we have our book, She Gate Crasher, which is going to be our, our, our next campaign. Not our next campaign. Our next campaign is the She Way of the Warrior 30th Anniversary um, uh, Original Art Edition. But come, come uh, February when we launch our next campaign, um, we're going to have Anna, it's called She Gate Crasher, and Anna does get trapped in comic book time and through all the genres, and she does have to battle through the horror comics genre. So that'll be a lot of fun. Um, Kevin, we have a, a Canadian $10 super chat from Mr. Paul yes. Taylor, and he's saying great chat tonight. Are there any plans to do werewolf vampire comics um, or do other companies own the rights? Like, I guess like Underworld. Could you do an Underworld comic? Yeah, yeah, or, yeah. yeah. I, I have a few Underworld comics out now. Mm -hmm. But continuing stories, I am going to do under my Darkstorm banner. So, yes, there will be un other werewolf vampire comics, just not Underworld. But mm -hmm. I do sell Underworld books at my table when I go to conventions. Yeah. So, um, uh, so people are asking. We have a lot of, uh, uh, and I know there's several reasons for it. One of the most is that who's got time to be on two platforms? Uh, for the the cool thing is this book is for the most part done, right? Yes, yes, yes. Have Have you considered going into doing it on other platforms like say um, Indiegogo or yes. Fun My Comic? You know, like yes. yeah. I, I am going to Indiegogo with the project. You know, as soon as we finish with the Kickstarter. You know, one of the things I'm doing. Uh, I'm just like I said, this is my first crowdfunding. You know, yeah. attempt. So Kickstarter is on everyone's mind, but you can't discount how well Indiegogo does too. Yes. And so the thing is, it's like, okay, well, let me launch on Kickstarter and then I'll do a campaign for Indiegogo as well. Excellent. Excellent. Well, sir, I, I like I said, I've hold, held you on for more than I, I told you we would. Um, but like I said, you're, pro, you're, you're, you're over $7,000 uh, you've got 36 days to go. Uh, you'll hit five figures in no time. And hopefully let's keep pushing this guys, guys, if, uh, if you can, and I know things are tough right now, you know, the holidays oh, yeah. are coming up, but if you could at least, uh, if you can't pledge, please pledge for this project. But if you, if you can't, can you at least share it on your social media, um, share it on your Twitter, on your Instagram, uh, if you're on Facebook or whatever platforms you're on, um, Again, Mr. Grievous is one of the good guys. He's uh, and, and someone I, a man I greatly admire, and I and, and it truly is a privilege uh, to have you on, sir. Um, oh, sorry, and it's, it's good. Yeah, it's and this good book would, to be on. Yep, and this book looks gorgeous. And so, okay, so this book's done. Um, you're going to put it out. You're going to get it done. You've you've passed yeah. the goal. Um, what's next for you, sir? Oh my goodness. I mean, I got a film I'm directing. Uh, I just finished a script for, we hired a, uh, well not hired, but you know, a, a producer, you know, a big producer came on uh, the project. So I'll be working with that. I have a TV show, a couple of TV shows in the works uh, and always more comics, you know, believe it or not, I have more fun doing comics than I do the you know the television the film projects which which pay me more money you know what i'm saying yeah and you know it's uh but you know but comics are you know one of those first love passions you know what i'm saying yep and you know i'm just glad to be a part of it thank you jesus for you know really yes, putting sir. this in my heart and wanting to get this stuff uh out to the fans and the you know customers things like that yeah and it does seem like it's your passion since you're a little kid and, oh, yeah, like, yeah. and and I guess you being in Hollywood, being around Hollywood or just being involved in the business for so long, I could see it kind of the, 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 the gloss is kind of tarnished on it a bit, huh? The sheen. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think it's because, like I said, you know, it's at the end of the day, everything becomes corporatized, yeah. you know, and. I understand from a business standpoint why that is. I just don't think it has to stay there. And I think there should be room 
for the artistic nature of it, but commerce and business is such a part of it that, you know, they're, they're really linked that, you know, they're, they're, they're really linked together. Yeah. And I yeah. think that's sad, but if yeah. you can, yeah. but like with crowdfunding, you know, crowdfunding is a way to step away from the corporatization of comics. Um, but unfortunately, independent film, unless you have your own cameras, you you know, you know how to edit yourself and all that, you, you know, it's kind of hard to stay away from the business aspect of it because you still have to sell it, you know, to foreign markets and all that. And those guys, you know, while a lot of them are good, a lot of them are just like, okay, you know, we want this for this reason, and that's and that reason only. And they might even ta um, tailor the trailer or the poster to feed on what they think they want, things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, which again takes away the artistic value sometimes. But you know, it is what it is. You know, that's why I think you do a comic book, you know, or graphic novel of your film if you know it's apropos uh, to really you know, keep the integrity and the purity of it, you know? Right. hundred percent. Well, well said, sir. And it's just, it's yeah. just work now, right? The film, exactly. film is, it's a job, I guess. Exactly. Well, well I want to thank you so much for, for, for coming on to the show. Uh, looking forward, please come back on again, especially when you launch it on Indiegogo. I think that'll be a oh, lot yes, of fun. I I and um, really looking forward to seeing that um, and how that works out for you, because I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised with the Indiegogo okay. audience as well. And right. um, I just want to thank you again for coming on. Like I said, you know, I'm a big fan of yours. That's why I'm a little stuttering a little bit here. Uh, I, I, I just greatly, no, I greatly admire you as a man and, and all of that you've accomplished, especially the stuff you've accomplished on your own. Um, and, and, uh, you, you've always seemed to be the captain of your own ship and, uh, and it's, it's, again, it's a true privilege to have you on everybody. Please go to, go to check out, uh, Jintara on Kickstarter, share this link if you can, or the, not this link, share the link to, 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 to the new book. And, uh, again, Mr. Grievous is one of the good guys and, uh, he's, he's, a it's, it's, again, it's a true privilege to have you on the pop XP. And uh, I want to thank you all for joining us. And I want to thank you, sir. Thanks a lot, Billy. You got it, guys. All right. So we'll see you in a bit. And uh, Kevin, thanks a million, man. And uh, we'll see you guys soon. Happy Halloween. All right. Thanks a lot. Okay. You guys take care. Hang on. Let me do my bell, sir. I need a bell. I need a bell like the old fashioned one. Bye, everybody. Hey everyone, thank you for joining us on Pop XP. If you haven't already, make sure to click that subscribe button and also click the bell for notifications when we go live and we upload some awesome new content. Also, don't forget to head on over to Twitter and follow us at the Pop XP and over on Instagram at the Pop XP. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you soon.